now I'd like to move on to the final presentation of uh, um, uh, the webinar, which I will be giving myself. And so I'm going to hand over to the Group Head of Trade, Suleiman Jiang, who will uh, chair this session. Suleiman, over to you. Yes, Ted, I was saying you can go ahead. Thank you for your introduction. I will be uh, letting you do your presentation and I'll be asking the questions later on. That's great. Thank you very much. Let me just share my screen. Uh, great, fantastic. So today I would like to use the short time that I have to talk about enhancing African trade through technology. We've heard about so many of the different strains and stresses that there are in the value chain, but the reality is that uh, uh, Africa is digitalizing rapidly and that is opening up a whole new range of possibilities for what can be done with digital technology in Africa's uh, value chain. And the trade value chain is very fragmented. So what is driving this? Well, what is clearly driving this is rapid digitalization of um, uh, the uh, uh, of uh, African markets and particularly mobile phone ownership. We have seen it grow by 540% in the last decade yeah, awesome. uh, in emerging markets. Um, and in particular, this means that uh, we see now 7 billion people in emerging markets um, using mobile phones compared with less than 2 billion in developed markets. Africa itself has had dramatic growth over that period. You can see the green line on there, over 800 million new, unique mobile phone subscriptions. And the reality is, if you go, that's for the whole of Africa. Um, that means that includes areas with no mobile coverage at all. If you go to a city, it's close to 100% because many people have multiple mobile phones. But what this means is that uh, for Africa itself, Africa is about to pass a digital tipping point. Um, we can see here from the graph that the numbers of mobile phone subscriptions have been rising dramatically since 2005. And even though mobile broadband subscriptions is relatively slow, we can see that population covered by 3G is now on a par with mobile phones. In fact, if you have a mobile, you have 3G. And that really means that Africa has passed this tipping point when over half the population have a mobile and 3G. This opens up incredible possibilities for what you can deliver to them in terms of financial services. And of course, on the back of this, we've seen an incredible growth in innovation in Africa. According to the latest estimates by the GSMA, um, there are 618 tech hubs in Africa. And by the far, the largest tech hub in Africa is Nigeria with 85, ahead of South Africa, the traditional um, leader of uh, tech innovation. Ghana, Egypt, Morocco, Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, Kenya, all of them have very rich ecosystems for developing fintech products. And this is really driving financial inclusion. If we look at the numbers, the statistics of financial inclusion, initially it looks very depressing. Uh, the graph on the left uh, from the World Bank estimates the amount of adults with access to a bank account. And you can see North America on the left there, 94%. Sub-Saharan Africa on the right, the lowest performer in the world with 33%. But if you look at the little red bobble on top of that uh, bar, you can see that 10% of Africans are getting mobile services from, uh, getting banking services from mobile money, either um, uh, using a, a telco wallet or using a bank account app. And in fact, over the last five years, all of those 10% have been added by mobile money which just shows how rapid it is and how it is changing the game. Uh, you could almost say that mobile money is an African product. If you look at the pie chart on the right, that is active mobile money wallets in the world, you can see Sub-Saharan Africa has nearly 60% of uh, mobile wallets in the world. And this means it opens huge possibilities for e-commerce. Um, if you look at this map produced by Brighter Bridges, um, they track uh, uh, various different sectors in Africa. And here you can see for e-commerce, there's over 250 e-commerce companies currently in Africa. Uh, this ranges from everything to rail high, uh, um, hail riding apps um, or to um, uh, food deliveries um, and all sorts of other digital services which can be delivered. And of course, we've seen a number of companies who've also uh, flipped their model with uh, COVID. There's a lot who before might have been delivering uh, food or clothes who are now delivering medical supplies in PPE. But it is an incredibly rich system that is growing and we're already seeing the increased value and increased interest from investors uh, in some of these companies, which could be unicorns. 
But where I see the real value that can come from using tech in the trade value chain is improving transparency and stamping out fraud. Fraud still remains the biggest problem that there is um, in uh, the, the trade value chain and the main cause of losses. But if you can digitalize payments and the flows of goods, you can greatly reduce fraud and also improve risk management. If you look at the top right there, one example, the Tanzania Customs Integrated System, TANSIS, a paperless system for managing payments of custom duties. This has cut out one of the cons whereby someone would import goods and say, I'm not paying customs because I will later export them, and then they never do. Instead, when goods arrive, they're registered digitally, they get a barcode, and money is paid into an escrow account. If the goods leave the country, that company receives the custom payments just with a simple swish of a barcode at the border. If the goods don't leave the country within a certain date, the money goes to the Tanzania Revenue Authority. And it's proved very effective. And in fact, this was helped to be developed by Echo Bank as the payment partner. But if we look at, for example, the COCO system in, in Cote d'Ivoire, incredibly disjointed, incredibly fragmented system. PCR and Agri Vanguard have a CC1 system, which monitors COCO value chain and gives data visualizations like you can see on the right and enables funding and payments all to be done digitally. This is definitely the future of trade and trade and trade tech in Africa. So the reality is fintech is embedded, whether it's the old lady at the Shabin paying for her groceries, someone topping up for M-Pesa, or farmers in the fields trying to do deals for the goods that they're going to be selling um, uh, at port. Uh, fintech is part and parcel of how people do business now. These people are part of the trade value chain, and this is going to help drive digital adoption in the trade value chain in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ted. Very brilliant, brilliant presentation, as usual. Just um, I've noted uh, the point on the mobile and on Africa passing the tipping point in terms of mobile penetration. Also, look uh, alleviating a bit of the, the, the banking penetration rate. Uh, and obviously the point that uh, technology can still play a very important role in, um, in basically uh, fostering uh, trade across the continent. One, one question, I think uh, one of some of the people have, um, have mentioned some of the challenges in terms of moving goods from, from one place to another. And in terms of the upcoming African uh, free trade continental zone, one question that comes to mind is how could technology uh, bridge uh, basically the knowledge gap and basically asymmetry of information between the producers and the buyers across the continent. And how could uh, technology-based commodity exchange uh, help to uh, bridge that gap? Uh, thank you, Suleiman. I think that's a, a very interesting question. I think one of the problems with trade is by its nature, the exporter and the importer don't tend to know each other. The trader sits in the middle and they benefit from that information difference. And that's often what you see in the trade value chain. Many intermediaries, some of whom you could say bring dubious value, if any value at all. But we've already seen in the last 10 years how the sharing of information is so much better. It's totally normal now for any farmer in anywhere in Africa, if they put their goods in the truck, they're going to text their brother in port and saying, what's the price that they're paying there? And they will get instant information on the prices. So that kind of price gouging doesn't occur as it did before. But where I see real potential with these yet yeah, platforms for trade, um, we've seen quite a few of them actually being delivered, uh, uh, developed by African banks to get SMEs together. Why is it SMEs exporting to other SMEs in other developing countries are going through uh, different intermediaries and getting you know, uh, um, uh, uh, high costs in the process? So I definitely think um, specifically designed uh, platforms like the one, for example, Bin Kabi has developed can really help connect together SMEs, cut out all the middlemen and potentially greatly reduce the transaction costs and make the trade profitable. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Uh, I would actually uh, uh, dwell on the point regarding transaction costs. I think some of the, the participants have also mentioned that. And I would want your perspective into how um, technology can also uh, help reduce uh, transactional costs. I think we've also discussed some of the, the, the currency uh, exchange and how the, the usage of US dollars or euro can, uh, can also increase the cost of trade. So I'd like you to have your perspective in how, for example, uh, the blockchain technology, cryptocurrencies can also help 
and be a catalyzer for uh, for uh, the development of the trade across the continent. Yes, thank you, Silverman. Yes, I think basically cryptocurrencies have been uh, uh, touted as one of the solutions to getting over this problem with uh, cross-border payments. But I think the important thing to understand is the trade value chain is full of a series of trust blockages. It might be that you need to authorize someone to make a payment. You might need a certain document like a bill of lading or an LC. You might need to have sign off by collateral managers or any other number of parties. And these blockages exist for a reason to prevent fraud. So digitalizing these blockages is the key. And therefore, a technology like blockchain is ideal. It's not that blockchain is a panacea for everything. It is an expensive technology. But if you want to be able to store things on the blockchain, such as uh, authorizations um, for, um, uh, for payments, uh, certain contracts, certain LCs, information about the parties, you know it's incorruptible. It can be instantly summed up um, if you need it by any of the parties. So for me, blockchain is about removing these different things. <coughs> and each time you do that, you reduce the time and you reduce the cost. And so it is possible as you build this uh, a blockchain network with all the people inside, that you could actually have con uh, smart contracts, which automatically do payments when certain things happen. And if you reduce payment times by 10, 15 days, that can make the difference between staying in business or not in the trade business. Thank you. Uh, that that covers the point. Um, maybe on uh, on uh, coming back to the the, the AFCFTA um, and how could basically uh, technology play a role? Uh, some of the uh, the, the the participants participants uh, also mentioned uh, the fact that uh, there's uh, uh, some some uh, um, uh, impediments in terms of the, the the need to determine rules of origin. Some of the other participants also mentioned the fact that uh, there could be additional cost uh, related to the actual custom duties. So uh, what's your perspective and how do you see technology playing a part in basically, uh, for example, improving traceability, uh, in, uh, playing a part in determining the, the origin of good in terms of the applicability of the rules of origin, and how would technology basically be an enabler in uh, basically the, the implementation of the AFTSP? Thank you, yes. Well, I think technology is the answer here because we are dealing with very complex value chains, lots of documentation, numerous opportunities for fraud. So one of the great things about if you have a technology like blockchain or instead a very good data management platform is if, for example, a container turns up somewhere with a single, single scan of a barcode, you know what is in there, who owns the container, where it's supposed to be, if you're allowed to release it. All that kind of information could be in a simple barcode or QR code, which could be shared across the region. And if you tie that together, for example, with customs, if you can digitalize the customs and the payments are made, it can immediately tell you duty has been paid automatically. No need for uh, no possibilities for any fraud, but also no blockages. We've all had the experience where there is a cargo of perishable goods and they perish at the port in the sun because they're being blocked either through inefficiency because the paperwork's not there or deliberately as a means of pressure. So I think this linking together of the different elements of the value chain is where huge value comes out. Because first of all, the traceability, you can really show where the goods are going, you can stamp out fraud. But number two is if you crunch that data afterwards, any bank such as Echo Bank can say, actually, we can see this is your normal trade cycle. We would like to offer this financing for your next trade cycle. So it really allows you to better um, anticipate the needs of your clients, but also to manage the risk better because you have so much better visibility of everything as it goes through the value chain, possibly even in real time. Excellent. Thank you, Ted. I'm conscious of time and I think we've just uh, uh, expired the time uh, that was given to this uh, session. So I thank you very much for your insights and I'll let you the floors for the next uh, steps. Thank you.